Good morning, everybody. Thank you guys so much for joining us. God is good. And all the time, oh, praise the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Once again, thank you guys so much for joining us this morning here at New Hope Kauai. Look, I'm going to be diving. I'm going to jump right into this morning's message titled Image. And I titled the message Image because I really believe that there is a pressure to conform our image. The, the way we look, the, the clothes we wear, the, the, the cars we drive, the, the jobs we take or the jobs that we don't take, the, the houses we live in, even to go as far as the people that we will surround ourselves with or even date for the sake of protecting or improving our image to reflect the worldly success and the appearance of happiness. You know, talking about dating, Talking about dating reminds me of a funny story of a really, really good friend of mine. If I was to mention his name, Corey Madaris, you would know exactly who I am talking about at the very mention of his name. And, and, and for the longest time, um, my friend, who I'm not going to mention, who is one of the leaders of the Levite ministry, great guy, for the longest time, as, as long as I knew him, the, the guy just couldn't get a date. All throughout high school, no matter what he did, no matter how hard he worked out, no matter the type of food that he ate, the car that he drove, no, no matter how nice the guy was, he just could not get a date. Winter ball? Uh-uh. Senior prom? Stag. <laughs> All throughout college, same thing, no matter how hard he tried. So finally, not too long ago, he... Uh, went and sought the help of a cosmetologist or someone who is a specialist in uh, uh, appearances. And so he, he goes and makes an appointment with this doctor. I think the name was Dr. Yao. He's from Japan. And, and so he, he goes to meet with Dr. Yao, and, and, and he, 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 he sits in the office, and, and Dr. Yao says, Please, Corey, explain to me your problem. So Corey proceeds to explain that, Hey, doc, throughout... As long as I can remember, no matter how hard I try, no matter what I do, I cannot seem to get a date. The doctor's taking some notes as he's looking at Corey. The doctor responds and says, oh, I see a problem. Corey says, really? He says, I, you have a disease. Corey says, I have a disease. Doctor says, I, you have Ed Zachary disease. Corey says, Oh my gosh, what do you mean? What, 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 what's Ed Zachary disease? The doctor says, Oh, your face looks uh, exactly like your butt. I would have used Pastor Frank, but then I wouldn't be lying. <laughs> I'm just kidding, brother. I'm just kidding. I rehearsed this joke 4 o'clock in the morning. A bus laugh. Oh, my God. Damn. I asked for his permission first. I asked for his permission first. He didn't quite know what the joke was going to entail. I told him it was going to be borderline. But I need all of you to do me a favor wherever you are. Wherever you are, I need you to find four people in your row. Find four people in your row. Give them a high five and a fist bump and tell them, man, you're looking good today. Four people. Come on, four. Get up out of your seat. Find four people. And tell them, man, you are looking great today. Everybody go give Corey one high five. You know, Corey, you are looking great today. Now, I need everybody to, I need everybody to look up. I need everybody to look up towards heaven, and I need everybody to say, thank you, Jesus, that I've been made in your image. And that's a very important statement to make, family. That's, a, that's, 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 that's huge to, to proclaim, to confess that I have been made, that I have been crafted, that we have been formed into the very image of our God. The Bible tells us in Genesis 1, chapter 26, in the creation story, God says to the Godhead, let us make man, let us make mankind in our image. And so in their, in their image and in their likeness, we have been made. So I don't care what the world says I need to look like. I don't. 
Because I know in whose image I am to reflect. But let me ask you folks this. How many of us here, because I know like my life, God has spoken a word over yours. I know that. And I know God has, has spoken to the very depth of your, of your soul, planted a seed of promise in the very good soil of your heart. But how many of us here, when we look in the mirror and we see our imagine, when we see our image, when we see our reflection, we don't see the very thing that God has spoken over us to be. Instead, we see ourselves in our current circumstance in our ever-present state. But I know God has spoken a word over you the way he has mine. Because I know every single person in this place that I look out, God has made you the head and not the tail. I know God has set you above and not below. I know God's word says that you are more than a conqueror. And that if he is, if he is for you, then who can be against you? That no weapon, no weapon formed against you, come on, shall prosper. But how many of us, when we look in the mirror, we don't see the very thing that God has spoken over us to be? Instead, like myself for so long, I end up seeing myself through the mirror that my past holds up for me to see. Many of you know my testimony that I'm a recovering crystal meth drug addict for a number of years, and every time I try to put my best foot forward, every time I try to do good, and every time I try to look in the mirror and encourage myself, the mirror of my past of addiction is the reflection that I see. How many of us here sees yourself through the past? The mirror that your past holds you up to see is maybe it's the, maybe it's the mirror of rejection. Maybe it's the... Uh, the mirror of mistakes. Maybe it's the mirror of past hurts or even abuse or failure or even pride. My question this morning is, what mirror is reflecting the image that you're seeing? Because if that's you like it was me, then I got a word for you this morning. I got a message for you this morning. If that's you, and if you fall asleep for the rest of the message today, before you do, please don't, but before you do, I need you to catch this in your very, catch this into the very depth of your soul. Whatever mirror that you were seeing your reflection in, today I'm here to tell you, your maker is your mirror. Come on, somebody. And while the world wants to conform us, to get us to comply, to get us to copy, to get us to match up to, the Savior is trying to transform us, to change us, to renew us, to make all things new. The old has passed and the new has come. The Apostle Paul says to the church in Rome, don't conform, transform into the image God has intended you to reflect. But what does that look like? What, what does... That transformation process look like a caterpillar into a butterfly. I've heard a, in 17 years. I've I've heard a few messages on transformation, and that is a very beautiful. That is a powerful illustration, a word picture of the transformation process that a caterpillar goes through to become a butterfly. Wouldn't you agree? I would. But I have a problem with that. I'm not a caterpillar. I may have looked like a caterpillar at one time in my life. You should have seen me at a dance floor. Yeah. BC, BC, sorry. If the joke was borderline, that was nothing. Okay. I may have looked like a caterpillar. I may have acted like a caterpillar in my previous days before I knew the Lord. And I did go through a transformation process. But I tell you what, I don't feel like I'm a butterfly. With wings in beautiful colors, I don't, I don't. When I look in the mirror, I don't see a butterfly. Maybe one moth. <laughs> but I had to come before the Lord and I had to ask him, Lord, what does that look like? I get the illustration. I get it. And I know I'm making light of it, but that's a beautiful illustration. But Lord, I need to see it in your word. I need to see what transformation looks like in your word because I'm not a butterfly, all truth be told. 
And so this morning, we're going to look at a transformation. We're going to look at a story in the Bible, not about a caterpillar, but about a man's life who is completely changed, along with his image, transformed and renewed after a single experience with Jesus. I'm going to be reading out of the chapter of Luke 8. It should come up with a PowerPoint behind me. The portion of Luke 8, which we're, we'll expound on a little later, is in your bulletins. But I want to set us up to get to that point. So Luke chapter 8, starting at verse 26. This is, a sto- this is a story about Jesus and the demoniac. Now just bear with me as we go through this. I'm going to read through this. And I want you to try and picture and, and, and pull out of the scripture three casts of characters. But before we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you. I thank you for this time. I thank you for your word. Lord, we love your word, Lord God, that transforms us and renews us, Lord God. The word that is hidden in our heart, Father God. And I pray, Lord, that you would, you would help, that you would use this most unworthy servant, Lord God, to, to preach your gospel, that Jesus would be glorified and we would glean gems that would change us from the inside out forever and ever for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Starting at verse 26, Luke chapter 8, I'll read. It says, so they arrived in the region of the Gerasenes, across the lake from Galilee. Verse 27, as Jesus was climbing out of the boat, a man who was possessed by demons came out to meet him. Let me pause there. One translation, one gospel actually says the man ran out to meet him. Everybody say ran. Continuing, for a long time he had been homeless and naked, living in the tombs outside the town. Verse 28, as soon as he saw Jesus, he shrieked, I don't know if that's how he shrieked, but he shrieked and fell down in front of him. Then he screamed, why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Please, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already commanded the evil spirit to come out of him. Let's stop there. Three casts of characters. Do you see them? There's a man, there's Jesus, and there's these demons. Now, a lot of times in church, we don't like to talk about demons. We don't even use that word. We, 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 we say spirits or um, the evil one or the enemy of our souls. But all truth be told, there is, there is there's a demonic presence out there. And this morning, and I battled with this, this verse of Scripture in this weeks to come because I'm like, Lord, I can preach transformation on Mount, on, on Mount Transfiguration. We can talk about baptism. That's a wonderful illustration of, of, of transformation. Even the caterpillar and the butterfly, anything but this. But every time I tried, it kept, it, it, it kept hitting a roadblock. And so I, I finally submitted and said, okay, Lord, then you need to show me. You need to show me in your word what your people need to hear. And then I got it. So stick with me. Let's go back to the beginning. So they arrived in a region of Gerasenes across from the Lake of Galilee. Verse 27, as Jesus was climbing out of the boat, a man who was possessed by demons ran out to meet him. This is a pretty extreme illustration. And this is why I battle with it. I'm like, Lord, I mean, come on. I don't believe any Christian can be demon-possessed. I don't. But I believe a Christian can open doors to the spiritual. I believe that a Christian can be spiritually afflicted. Come on, somebody. Spiritually oppressed, but he cannot be demon-possessed. So if in this story, this is the most extreme picture the Bible can give me about a man who is possessed, not by one demon, demons, plural, multiple demons. If this is the most extreme picture that the Bible can, can have us illustrate and look at, We see the man who is in himself, the man, recognizes Jesus. He runs to Jesus. In the presence of Jesus, the demon sees Jesus. This is like a typical, this is not a typical, this is like a a story out of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The man sees Jesus, he runs to Jesus. He gets in the very presence of Jesus. The demon who is in the man recognizes Jesus, according to Scripture, shrieks, falls before him. Right? Right? It's in the scripture. So if a demon, in the very presence of God, the king of kings himself, must fall to his knees, scripture starts to come alive. The Bible tells me that 
even at the very name of Jesus, every knee up in heaven, here on earth, and down below must bow. Every knee must bend. Every knee must break at the very presence of Jesus. So now, I'm getting excited. So now, if a demon has to bow in the very presence of Jesus, the spirit of lust, you must go in Jesus' name. The spirit of infirmity, you must bow in the name of Jesus. Cancer, you must bow in the name of Jesus. Depression, you must bow in the name of Jesus. Cancer, you must bow in the name of Jesus. Perversion, lust, pornography, you must bow in the name of Jesus. The spirit of poverty, you must bow in the name of Jesus. Whatever you got going on with you must bow in the very presence of Jesus. But there's a catch. You got to first run to Jesus. Whether physically or in your heart, you must first run to Jesus. The Bible will go on and tell us the interaction that Jesus now has with this demon. Demon pleads, pleads with Jesus. Why you don't torture us before our due time? They, they, they beg him, don't, don't send us into the bottomless this pit. And, and they actually ask him, send us into these pigs that are over here off, off to the side. And, and Jesus does so, knowing the end result. Jesus allows them, casts them out of the man, sends them into the herd of pigs which we now encounter the very first, not swan dive, but swine dive to their demise. Which takes us to our scripture this morning. We're going to jump forward to Luke chapter 8, verse 35. It's in your bulletins. Come up on the PowerPoint behind me. It creates such a large commotion. An entire herd of pigs Diving off of a cliff to their demise, they all die. The entire townspeople rush out. And we see this in verse 35. In verse 35, it says, The people rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd, so, a crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been freed from the demons. Now get ready, catch this. He was sitting at Jesus' feet, fully clothed, and perfectly sane. And they were all afraid. Verse 36, then those who had seen what happened told the others how the demon-possessed man had been healed. And this morning, out of this passage of Scripture in your bulletins, I want to highlight and I want to look at four images of transformation. Jesus delivers this man from his affliction, from his possession. The entire crowd hears or sees the commotion of the pigs. That's a whole other message and a whole other story. But he draws the crowd. The crowd draws and they focus around Jesus and they see. And they see. They see the man who was once living in the tombs. The man who was once homeless or, or naked. The, the, the man that was an outcast. Cast off to the side. They see the man now. Where is he? They see the man sitting at Jesus' feet. Our first image of transformation this morning, if, if you were to go back 2,000 years ago, to, to sit at the feet of a rabbi in the days of Jesus would, would mean to take up the role of a student and a teacher. And in today's day and age, we call that discipleship. Much of what all of you are doing this morning, to take time out from a busy week, two days off, and to, to, to come on a Sunday, to come and sit at the very feet of Jesus. That's such a beautiful picture of the first image of transformation. That a man would leave his former life. If any of you wants to be my follower, the word says you must turn from your selfish ways. You must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And to be found like this man sitting at the very feet of Jesus. I love that illustration. The second thing we see is we see the man fully clothed and perfectly sane or in his right mind. The man 
after this tra- in this transformation process, after an encounter with the king, we see him take on a new standard of behavior. He's fully clothed. One of the joys I get up here um, from this vantage point of view and over the years is to see people who have come through these doors in their present state and be slowly transformed. And, it's, and on the outside, it's such a wonderful thing to see. Their whole demeanor changes. Their whole outlook on life changes. I think for number one, because they spend time at the feet of Jesus. They spend time in his word and they hide God's word in their heart. In fact, they are hidden in God's word. And then now the transformation process begins from the inside out. We see the man seated with a, with fully clothed. I love what Colossians chapter 3 says in verse 12. It says, we are to clothe ourselves with compassion. Kindness, humility, gentleness. It's, it's, almost, it's almost identical to the fruit of the Spirit that we will bear through this transformation process. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. This man starts to bear fruit of the Spirit as he's found at the feet of Jesus, now fully clothed physically and spiritually. Then we see him perfectly sane or in his right mind. For me, this suggests wholeness. The, the once broken and fragmented life of this man is now fully gathered together. That perhaps like you and I, the, the things that used to drive us crazy, they don't bother us anymore. Why? Because of the renewing of our minds. The Apostle Apostle Paul said in the beginning, as I quoted, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. What a beautiful picture of transformation, of an encounter with Jesus. Be found sitting at his feet, rightfully clothed physically and spiritually, putting on these garments of praise and love and joy and above all these things, put on love, which binds all of these things together, the Bible says. And then to be found perfectly whole with his mind sound. Nothing can bother him like it used to. Nothing drives him mad like it used to because of the transformation process that he's going through. I found three images of transformation in here that deal directly with the man. But there's a fourth one. In the last scripture in your bulletin today, bulletin today, it says, verse 36, Then those who had seen what happened told others how the demon-possessed man had been healed by Jesus. The fourth image of transformation is evangelism starts to happen. It's the sharing of the gospel. The preaching of the good news. Your life becomes a gospel to be shared. You guys know... There are four Gospels in the Bible, right? Right? Agreed? Right? Four Gospels. What if I was to take it a step further and say there were actually five? There are four written Gospels in the Bible. But I'm saying there's five. The four written are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the fifth is still being written. The fifth Gospel is you. People are reading your Gospel. A mentor of mine once quoted me this phrase that stuck with me ever since the beginning of my walk with Jesus. He said, son, preach the gospel. And if you have to, use words. You see, the life you live sometimes can speak volumes instead of the words that come out of your mouth. Now, don't get me wrong. Words can be hurtful. But people are reading your life. If you're a Christian... The fifth gospel of your life is being written, even so right now. As you go through this transformation process, people are watching you. People are reading your life. Preach Jesus. And if you have to, use words. As I close this morning, if you feel like you're going through a transformation process, You've been coming to church for a while, or maybe you've been coming for a long time. I'm still going through a transformation process. Can I be encouraged this morning? Trust the process. 
It's not a tough message to preach. Just trust the process. There's going to be times it's not going to be comfortable. In fact, there's going to be times it's going to be uncomfortable. There's times it's not going to feel good. In fact, there's going to be times that you're going to feel the heat, the heat of change. There's another beautiful illustration that I've heard over the years, very well preached. It's about the refiner's fire. You guys know how pure gold is developed, right? We can't make gold. We cannot make gold. We discover gold. We mine for gold. But when we, when we attain gold, you know how you get pure gold? It goes through a thing called the refiner's fire. Gold is heated. And when it gets to a certain temperature, the impurities within the gold, which is called dross, the refiner, as it surfaces to the top through the heat that it goes through, the refiner scrapes away the dross or the impurities, and he heats it again. And he continues to do this until all of the impurities rise to the surface so that it can be taken away. The question is, how does the refiner know the process is complete? When the refiner can look into the gold and see his reflection. I got another problem with that. I'm not gold. I got some gold fillings. I got some gold teeth. But I'm not gold, Dad. So I have to ask the Lord again. I need you to show me. Show me your word, Lord. The Lord says, boy, you got to open your eye. Read more. Sit at my feet more. I said, okay. A very good friend of mine. He, so hungry in the word. I was going to share this. It's not really part of the closing message. He, he calls me one day. He's like, hey, pastor, pastor, cuz, you know, oh, you can help explain this to me. And, 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 and he's, he's doing his devotion Sunday after church. I'm like, praise God. And, and, and he's asking questions. And, and so through that, he's like, because, you know, I, oh, I'm trying to read everything. I, I just trying to take as much in as I can, you know. And, and, and we stop and we have a moment to share. And I, I, I remember telling him this. I remember saying to him, I said, you know, hey, cousin, wisdom cannot be gained in a day. But it can be gained daily by sitting at the feet of Jesus. So sitting at the feet of Jesus, I asked the Lord, you need to show me in your word, Lord, because I'm not gold. I know I'm precious in your sight, but you've got to draw a picture for me, Lord. He says, search my word, mine, my word. Scratch the surface of it. And so I did. In the creation story that we talked a little bit, a little bit about in the beginning, scholars and theologists speculate where exactly the Garden of Eden was, is. But the Bible says when God made man, he formed man out of what? Dirt. The dust of the earth. And then he, he breathed and gave the man life. Now when I go back and I look, and I try to research in the region, now just follow me, when I try to research the region where God created the garden, then he put the man in the garden. So in that region, the creation story, is the Tigris Euphrates in Mesopotamia, in that region. Now, this is where I love science, proving the Bible true. If you were to look at the ge geological makeup of the region, in the creation story, much of the ge geological matter are made up of two parts, silica, iron oxide. Stay with me. Silica, iron oxide. You know what happens when you heat up silica in low doses, low doses of iron oxide? Silica is actually a part of sand. When you heat sand, what do you get? Glass. If you and I are formed from the very dust of the earth with the compounds of silica and iron oxide, and we go through the heat of life, glass is formed. What does glass do? It reflects. Through the transformation process, if you feel the heat of life, or life in general, and you're going through the heat and the uncomfortableness, 
recognize it. Seize it. Because God may be trying to run you through a process, a transformation process. Sitting at his feet, fully clothed in your right mind. Others reading the gospel of you. When you go through that change and you feel the heat of life, there are two things that you can do. You can either break and be shattered, as glass does. But if you know one thing about glass, it can also be mended through the heat. Or you can choose to reflect the image of your maker. Because your maker is your mirror. How many says amen to that this morning? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you. I thank you. Father, for I went too long. The battery is dying. Lord, okay. I give you praise. I give you honor. Lord, I give you glory, Father God. I thank you that from here I get to look out and I see people who are committed to the transformation process, Lord God. And I thank you that you will cover them in your love and protect them, Lord God, as they go through this, knowing that as they go through the process, the end result, Lord God, is that we would see your finished work, Father God. And help us recognize that when we go through these times, that it's you doing your best to clear the dross from our life, impurities and pockets in our hearts that maybe we thought we had forgotten about, maybe thought things that we thought we had dealt with, Lord God. But you're such a good, good father. That you would allow these things to happen, to remove these things and impurities from our hearts, that when we go through the heat of life, we would reflect the image of our maker. We thank you. We love you. We glorify you. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and everybody says, amen.